In the previous segment of the course, we talked about genetic variation and monogenic disease. This time, we'll move on to talk about genetic variation and complex trait disease. Many common diseases, such as asthma, Alzheimer's, the diabetes, and Crohn's disease are of this type. In contrast to monogenic disease, where a single mutation in one or both copies of a gene leads to a disease phenotype, in complex trait disease, variants in many loci around the genome contribute to the probability of a disease phenotype. For some diseases, we now know over a hundred loci that contribute, and it's probable there is a long tail of loci where variants contribute more weakly. Environmental factors may also play a major role. Also unlike monogenic disease, many of the relevant genetic variants have a subtle effect on protein function, and many of these act by altering gene expression levels. Each also makes a small contribution to total disease risk. A further difference is that most of the variants involved are common single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, occurring with a population frequency of greater than 1%. These common single base variants are a small fraction of all the SNPs, nearly all of which are rare. Our understanding of this type of disease has been revolutionized by a new technology, genome-wide association studies, GWAS. Beginning in about 2007, this methodology has identified many genes previously not suspected as being involved in particular complex trait diseases. The slide shows the principle of this genotyping technology. DNA fragments spanning the position of known SNPs are extracted from the genomes of a large number of individuals displaying the trait of interest and a large group of controls who do not display the trait. Complementary DNA sequences spanning the position of these SNPs are mounted on a microchip or attached to beads. Fluorescent readout after addition of a sample allows rapid measurement of each SNP status in an individual. There's no SNP present, one copy of the SNP, or two, that is the individual is homozygous for the SNP. Current technology allows the status of about a million or more SNPs in each individual to be determined in this way. But that's much smaller than the total of about 40 million SNPs in the human population. Nevertheless, because of a correlation between the presence of neighboring SNPs, termed linkage disequilibrium, it's possible to use imputation methods based on a sample of a million to determine the status of a large fraction of all SNPs. Statistically different frequency of a SNP in case and control samples implicates that locus as associated with the disease in some way. The figure shows an example of how these data look for one locus. The black dots show the probability that each measured SNP is correlated with the trait. The grey dots show the probabilities for the imputed SNPs. You can see there's an area of higher association between the two dotted lines. In this case, nine different genes lie in this region. So you can see it can be difficult to determine which gene is actually involved in the disease mechanism. But by now there have been follow-up studies for a number of the most interesting loci not only verifying the relevant gene, but also elucidating aspects of the mechanism by which a variant affects the phenotype. The next figure shows the type of data which results from the statistical analysis for one individual. The first column shows the relative lifetime risk of the individual having the disease phenotype compared with the reference population. In this case, the highest relative risk of 2.01, just over twofold, is for atrial fibrillation increasing the risk from 25 to 50 percent. Let's have a look in more detail at where such a number comes from for another one of the traits shown, risk of Crohn's disease. In this case, that is slightly elevated at 1.18. We can break that down into contributions from representative SNPs in each locus. For example, this individual is homozygous for a risk allele in the gene bassoon, BSN. And that factor alone increases the relative Crohn's risk to 1.24. On the other hand, there are no risk alleles present in a SNP in NOD2, reducing the risk by about 15%. So one up, one down. The total risk on the previous slide is calculated as a weighted sum of these individual SNP contributions. A puzzle about the GWAS results is that these additive models explain only a fraction of the observed heritability. 
A measure of the extent to which children in families where the trait has been observed also have that trait. For example, for type 2 diabetes, the model explains less than a third of the heritability, and for many other diseases, the fraction is even smaller. Multiple explanations have been suggested for this discrepancy. As mentioned earlier, it is likely there are many weaker associations which current GWAS studies are too small to detect. Indeed, there is a strong correlation between study size and the number of loci identified. A second likely explanation is that an additive model is woefully inadequate to describe the complex and interactive underlying biology. In support of this, model organisms, even yeast, have a very large number of nonlinear interactions between pairs of genes, up to 99 interactions per gene. These are known as epistatic effects. It would be surprising if humans are simpler in this respect. Yet a third potential factor is the role of rare variants. In order to provide an adequate statistical signal, GWAS typically requires variants to be of 1% or higher frequency in the reference population. As we have learned, the majority of variants are rare, and so a relationship to a disease cannot be detected with this technology. Exome sequencing directly finds all rare and common variants in coding regions and is beginning to supplant microarray type technology, but it's still relatively expensive. Results so far from that on the role of rare variants are ambiguous. Partly this is due to limited coverage of expression variants in typical exome sequence, and so full genome sequence is really needed. In many ways, we are still only at the beginning of exploiting the increased knowledge of complex trait disease that started with GWAS. It has turned out not to be simple to identify new drug targets directly from GWAS results, but a number of clinical trials are now underway, and there are already some successes with drug repurposing. For example, drugs targeting the IL-23 pathway are effective in the treatment of psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease. As the underlying biology becomes clearer, extrapolation from GWAS implicated genes to implicated pathways will offer more opportunities. So far also, knowledge of the underlying biology has not been utilized to influence drug choice depending on a patient's genotypes. New GWAS on more clinically relevant phenotypes are now beginning to provide useful prognosis information and, for example, for Crohn's disease, this has revealed different loci from those associated with disease risk. Finally, additional omics data types, such as expression profiles, protein abundance, metabolite concentration, and epigenetic status, are going to be combined with genomic variant information, and this will help increase biological understanding and, as a consequence, clinical utilization of these data. We are now at the end of this unit discussing the relationship between germline genetic variation and disease. I find this subject really fascinating and I hope I have encouraged you to explore it further.